My name is Andrew McIntyre. I'm the Dean uh, here at the College of Asian Pacific. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody uh, to this special lecture this afternoon by Dr. Sakuni Abdullah, uh, Malaysia's Deputy Minister for Higher Education. Let me begin uh, by acknowledging the first Australians, the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we're meeting, uh, and to pay my respects uh, uh, to their elders, past and present. It's great to see so many people here on an afternoon like this. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I didn't say to Dada Sakudin as we were leaving my office, but the thought going through my head was, I wonder if anyone's going to come out in, uh, uh, in weather like this. So, so I'm really pleased that people have uh, uh, persevered uh, to be with us. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to um, welcome not just members of the university, but um, uh, official guests, people who have come from across the lake, but above all, of course, uh, Daho Saifuddin and his wife, Daphne Nordin. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you with us uh, uh, here at the university. Um, as many people in this room will know, uh, Malaysia has a long tradition of producing really remarkable uh, political leaders. Um, uh, and uh, for those of you who don't yet know uh, Daho Saifuddin well, um, he is uh, unambiguous. Uh, one of the uh, very brightest and most rapidly rising stars uh, in Malaysia's political firmament. Having been president of the influential uh, Malaysian Youth Council, he was elected to parliament uh, in 2008, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and immediately appointed uh, to the position of uh, Deputy Minister for Higher Education. Uh, the year after being elected to council, uh, being elected to parliament, he was made a member <coughs> of uh, UMNO Supreme Council, the Supreme, uh, the Supreme Council, the Supreme Body uh, of his party. Prior to entering Parliament, he worked <coughs> in, a, in a range of fields, uh, including business, teaching, uh, editing, and he's published widely. Uh, he's, he's, he writes extensively, as we were remarking before, he puts Boris Johnson to shame, uh, he, he, he publishes uh, uh, extensively um, still uh, in newspapers uh, and is the author, if I'm not mistaken, of four books. And uh, I got a new job this afternoon. I signed, up, I signed up for a new job this afternoon. And that's to be um, sole agent uh, um, for at least half a dozen copies. Um, so uh, any, seriously, uh, anyone who would like a copy of his uh, most uh, uh, recent book, uh, New Politics uh, Towards a Mature Malaysian Democracy, uh, copies here. You can have all but one, because one of them is mine. <laughs> um, um, more than anything else, I would say, Dato uh, Saifuddin is known as somebody who's pushing and pushing hard from inside the system inside the system of government to present a, a more democratic face of politics uh, to younger Malaysians. Um, uh, I was looking at things that one might say about him and I thought, well, there's no better source than what one of our own students has said about him recently in a very dangerous place, <laughs> in a blog, <coughs> which is where all sorts of subversive things get said. And, and one, of, one of the quite influential blogs coming out of this college is a blog called New Mandala, um, which focuses on particularly um, mainland Southeast Asian um, politics. And um, uh, one, of our, one of our students from, from Malaysia um, had this to say in closing a recent blog post uh, about you. He said, will he lead a new wave of UMNO leaders that returns UMNO to the centre, or will he be UMNO's last Mohican? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that looks like you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and a very good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dean Andrew and Professor Funston, uh, for having me here. It is really an honor to be here. And this is 
Actually, a long overdue visit to ANU. I'm supposed to be here like last year in November, and then we postponed it to April, and finally, uh, I am measuring the four season in one day in camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the reason for the delay is because we don't know when the general election is going to be. Um, and if you were to ask me today, this, when is the GE 13 coming? And my answer will be very simple. Uh, we will have the GE immediately after we dissolve parliament. <laughs> and if you were to continue with an additional question, when will you dissolve parliament? My answer will be just before we do the general election. <laughs> Either way, politicians will want to win. Uh, we have about, uh, from here until, from now until about 4.30 or so, and uh, I will divide my sharing this afternoon into two parts. Uh, the first part I will try and uh, speak a little bit about, about what I understand as new politics and uh, it's effect or its influence rather, uh, or its relevance on the coming general election, uh, 13. And then uh, I will leave time for <coughs> Q&A uh, as the second part of it. Uh, new politics is not a term that I find. And this is not, I'm sure I'm not the first person who use the term new politics. At least two books or compilation of uh, articles were published immediately after the 1999 general election. And that was general election 11. One was published by UKM, uh, National University of Malaysia. Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but it has some new politics on it. Another was published by ICS in Singapore, Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. Also have new politics as the title. Both are compilations of articles written by academics, uh, Malaysians and non-Malaysians. And uh, <coughs> the main crux of the two books were a hope that some kind of new politics uh, will emerge <coughs> in Malaysia. And maybe one or two articles uh, giving the signal that perhaps new politics is defined by a new set of regime or a regime change uh, after uh, general election 11, 2000, uh, sorry, in 1999. I do not know why after general election 12, 2004, people don't talk about new politics. At least I don't see articles being written on the politics. Is it because Baisa National won uh, its biggest victory in local politics? Or is it because people feel that there is no more hope for new politics? Or people tend to wait for another uh, general election result before they talk again about new politics. Uh, I must confess uh, that may not be the right way to look at uh, new politics in recent years in Malaysia, but uh, the reason why I am starting with that note is simply because uh, there is really no, not much of uh, discussion, serious discussion rather, on politics, except discussing on election, <coughs> results of election, what it means uh, to win and what it means to lose. And I believe that politics is more than less than. So I have my own column in one of the local newspapers uh, starting, I think, 2005 or 2000, I think it was in 2006 and I started writing about new politics. <coughs> but I don't have a definition, except saying that we need new, more healthy, more fresh, cleaner politics. We need a new kind of political culture, 
we need to uh, bring the conversation to another level. Uh, we need a, polit a political discourse that is more healthy. That's how I look at new politics. Beyond that, I tried, and this is what I did in my, in my book, which was published in 2008 and launched by Dr. Srinajit when he was Deputy Prime Minister in 2009. Uh, no, I don't pay commission to Dean Andrew <laughs> for the commercial. To me, uh, there are at least two, two things uh, which makes politics new or which makes new politics in this country or in, in Malaysia. <coughs> Firstly, it's about integrity, about political integrity. And this, to my mind, is more about my party rather than uh, the government as such. We went through a long history of uh, winning elections. And mind you, I wrote this before uh, 2008. It's published after the general election of 2008. But the content of the book was written early on, uh, starting 2006 and 2008. So it's not about 2008 results. I've already been talking about it before uh, 2008. Yeah. We have done well. I think we have uh, become, we have formed government for more than 50 years now, 50 years at that time when I started writing. But I thought the party needs a lot of uh, revivalism, both in its idealism, the principles that uh, party members adhere to, and more importantly, uh, I sense and I know for a fact that there are some practices within the party which needs to be uh, improve, in particular uh, in relation to uh, corrupt politics, money politics to be exact. Yeah. And my understanding of uh, political integrity is that politics must be based on certain principles, on perjuangan, as you say in Malay, uh, on <coughs> idealism, or well, you can call it whatever, but you must have a good reason why you join politics. That's it. And definitely, you don't join politics because of vested interest. Uh, because you think you can become rich, you can become uh, wealthy because you you join politics, and after that, you you you, you hold certain positions. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, after GE two thousand eight, and in particular after Najib become president of Amno. Uh, he uh, started talking about uh, cleaning the party from bad practices and to cut a long story short, he amended the constitution of the party. Uh, among others, uh, it used to be less than 3,000 delegates decide who becomes president and members of the Supreme Council. I came in uh, because I have 1,700. So I, I, I secured 1719 votes <coughs> from about 2,800 delegates, so I become a member of the Supreme Council member. But uh, after the amendment in 2009, <coughs> our next party election, which will come after the general election, you will see 150,000 members uh, voting. And they come from the 191, 191 uh, divisions all throughout the country. Uh, except Sarawak because we don't have Amno in Sarawak. What does this mean? Uh, how is this relevant to money politics? Well, in the past, <coughs> all you need to do is to ensure you, you know how many votes you need to win the seat. You know who the delegates are because they are less than 3,000 people. So if you know them well, you send enough signals, signals, uh, online or offline, uh, you get their votes. Uh, I mean, you can buy uh, 1,700, I, I didn't, I didn't, of course I didn't buy this. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I was one of those, uh, you know we have this SK and SA uh, uh, handshake during the, uh, during the campaign. 
uh, this is the Malay acronym. If I were to translate into English, it would be uh, uh, what do you call uh, e, e, e H and uh, E H means empty handshake, empty, nothing inside. Okay, the other one will be what? Um, uh, feel? Yeah, yeah. half H. So half H. So they will ask you. Saifuddin is coming to see delegates from Para. Is he an EH or FH? <laughs> so some delegate will say, oh, because he's an EH, I'm not going to see him. You know, empty handshake. No, no, I, you don't get anything except for the food. Food is okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Malaysians like food, food. Eating is our national hobby, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay for politicians to throw parties, but, uh, but we don't pay. I don't. Yeah. But now, for the coming uh, party election, well, if you think you have money and you can buy votes, you have to buy 150,000 delegates. And you have to be uh, no less than Bill Gates or uh, Warren Buffett uh, to become a more president. Now, I'm very happy that something uh, has been, uh, something concrete has been uh, uh, Now, but integrity is not just about money politics or combating uh, money politics. I think uh, integrity or political integrity is also about uh, uh, bringing the political discourse to a higher level. Uh, uh, conversations on politics must entail more than just about results, about more, I mean, the election result, but more about service, uh, about knowledge politics. Uh, and so on and so forth. The second thing I wrote in the book is about the need for us in Malaysia to come up with a new governance framework. We are normally familiar with the term good governance. Now, uh, I'm a strong supporter of good governance and I would consider good governance as part and parcel of integrity or political integrity. But here I'm talking about a governance framework. I think we all know that in any modern democracy like Malaysia, uh, it is not only the government that make decisions uh, on nation building matters. There are also the other two sectors which are equally important, uh, i.e. the business sector and the civil society. What we have is we have a government uh, and then we have uh, the business sector and the civil society working together. Uh, but my wish is if we can work together better as real, genuine partners in development and partners in decision making. What is currently happening, perhaps now slightly better than when I started writing about it, is that if I can use three circles to represent the three sectors. You would have the government at the top, and then you would have business and civil society. They do work together, but if only we can bring it to a new level where the three uh, circles are interlocked like the Olympic rings, where you really work together as partners. Uh, I don't see them interlocking as yet, but I think we are slowly moving towards that, where government genuinely recognize the other two sectors as equal partners uh, in decision-making structures and processes, right from the federal level down to the state, or rather, right from the grassroots to the state and to the federal level. It's not happening yet, but it's moving slightly, uh, slowly but surely towards that direction. And why do I say that? I'll give you an example. <coughs> Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with One Malaysia, uh, sorry, the GTP, uh, the Government Transformation Program. Uh, during Mahathir's time, uh, his most famous <coughs> policy would be Vision 2020. Uh, when he wants to, to do uh, Vision 2020, he appointed uh, someone, and that someone happens to be the late uh, Nodin Sopi, a uh, leading uh, intellectual, the 
the director of ISIS Malaysia at the time, yeah. And he uh, uh, called a few people and they wrote the text of the speech. Uh, the title of the speech was Malaysia, uh, The Way Forward. <clears throat> it was delivered in one seminar, in one conference. The media gave it a new name, Vision 2020. So that's how it came. One team, one speech, one seminar, one policy. Yeah, very quick, very fast. When Abdullah Badawi was Prime Minister, his most famous policy would be Islam Habari. But he chose a different way uh, in launching the project. It was not one person, one team, one seminar. It was a few teams working on it. A few seminars, conferences were organized. There were some debates in the newspaper. And after a couple of months, then only Islam Hadari uh, came, as a, came out as a policy. When Prime Minister Najib wanted to do the GTP, he took another path, which I thought is more democratic, more progressive. <coughs> Started with uh, the team, he, 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 he formed a team, and uh, they looked at all the letters that were sent to local newspapers for the last few years, thousands of it. They look at the many research that was done before he became prime minister, before he became prime minister, including the research that tell you uh, the kind of professions or work or jobs that Malaysians trust and Malaysians don't trust. And you know uh, the profession that Malaysians trust most, medical doctor. The one that they don't trust most, politicians. Uh, and then uh, he formed Pemandu, which is, which is actually a steering uh, committee, or rather it's a department, a full-fledged uh, department, led by Idris Jala, not a politician, a technocrat, a very successful uh, technocrat. Uh, his last posting was as the CEO of MAS, our national carrier. Um, about 900 people were appointed, or were, were, yeah, were invited to sit on the Pemandu committees, and they come from all of the three sectors, the state, including political parties, the business, and the civil society. They spend about three months going through the nine, going through the six uh, national key areas. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, uh, I thought Prime Minister would then launch the GTP, but no. Uh, instead, uh, he insisted that uh, we do some some more uh, consulting with the people, with the rakyat. And exhibitions were held in Kuala Lumpur, Kuching, and Kota Kinabali. About 25,000 people came. Oh yes, there was the website, and there was the SMS, and all kinds of social media activities pertaining to the GTP. All in all, more than 200,000 Malaysians from all walks of life, from representing all stakeholders, uh, of course, from the three major sectors were directly or indirectly involved. It took him, it took the Prime Minister almost six months before he actually officially launched uh, the GDP, the Government Transformation Program. Whether it is effective, whether the implementation is right or wrong, that's question number 21. But the point is, there was consultation uh, among the three uh, major stakeholders. And that is his way of walking his talk. What was his talk? He is the first Malaysian Prime Minister that I can remember of. Uh, in more than two or three occasions, uh, telling the people that gone are the days when the government is the be all and the know all and the do all. I thought that was a very symbolic gesture from a Prime Minister who understand the position and the role and the contribution of the other sectors. Uh, i.e. the business and the civil society. I cannot claim that he take it from me, but uh, as I said, I wrote it in 2006-2007. He published, he, he, I published it in 2008, he launched it in 2009, before he became Prime Minister. I'm working on two other things now, uh, and that's supposed to be the next book, uh, but, uh, you know, politicians, I have. 1001 excuses why it's not been written yet. Um, 
The other two would be innovations in democracy and political, sorry, progressive political thoughts. Uh, innovations in democracy is, I must confess, uh, is also the title of the book. I, find, I, 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 I bump into Graham Smith book by the same title, so even when I, when I write my book, I don't know when, I will have to use another title or, or, or I have to be, I, I risk being sued by Graham Smith. Uh, but I share uh, uh, many of the things that he, he, uh, he wrote in his book that, for instance, many young people are very cynical and skeptical towards politics and politicians and political parties and political institutions. Why they are cynical and skeptical? The reasons are plenty, but fortunately, they still have faith in democracy, provided democracy is reformed or the practice of democracy is reformed. And part of the reform, besides integrity and the framework, uh, is also about innovations in decision-making processes or structures. The GTT process, uh, I thought, is quite an innovative uh, way of doing things, of making decisions. As a rookie MP from Tumurlo, I start my own uh, grassroots parliament, I call it. Uh, you see, we don't have elections for local council. So I have to think of a way of getting voices from the grassroots uh, into decision-making process. Uh, there are uh, two important committees at the grassroots level in every district in Malaysia. One is the district, Majlis Tindakan Daerah, District Action Committee, checked by the district officer, <coughs> the DO. Uh, the members comprises the district officer, his senior officers, politicians from the ruling party of that state, Unfortunately, only from the ruling party of the state and heads of departments, government departments. No representation from either the business or the uh, civil society. The other important committee is the local council. Uh, local council, uh, the councillors are appointed by the state, uh, minimum of, I think, 12, maximum of 24 or 22, I can't remember exactly and they represent the party uh, from the state. If there is a young member who becomes a councillor, it is more often than not he is the youth leader or the youth wing leader of the ruling party uh, from that district. Uh, he is not the youth leader elected by the youth uh, from the civil society. So, uh, and if there is a woman uh, as a councillor, chances is she is the the leader of the women's wing of the party and not representing the women as we understand it uh, in civil society. If there is a businessman uh, as a councillor, chances is he happens to be a businessman but he represents the party. So he represents the party. He's not representing the business sector. Uh, so what I do is I form, uh, I call this the Temerlo Parliamentary Consultative Council. Uh, I chair it. Uh, we meet twice a year for half a day. Uh, we started with 60 members coming from all the three uh, stakeholders. Now the number has grown to 160. Uh, we have met six times. We have we should have met eight times, but you see, my problem is I'm the only one doing this thing, and there's no template that I can borrow from any other MPs in Malaysia. So it's very difficult. It's true trial and error. The first meeting becomes like a complaint bureau. Uh, people don't think they come here to make decisions, but here is the MP, first time some more. So let's fire some good questions. So the first meeting was not like a parliament, it was like a Q&A. Mm -hmm. But by the time we reach the second, the third meeting rather, it becomes like a parliament uh, or something like a parliament where members actually speak up on issues. Uh, and the reason for me was very simple. It's a two-way communication platform. Uh, on the one hand, here I am representing the government. You voted me in. 
this is what the government is planning to do for Tembelo and for my state, for our state Pahang and for Malaysia, blah blah blah. But more importantly, the second point is, look, I'm supposed to represent you in Parliament. As a Deputy Minister, I don't debate, but I can, I can, fail, I can, I can uh, relay your messages to my colleagues who can speak on my behalf because I'm sure your issues are not peculiar only to Tumalo. They also have the same issues. So I do that. And this is the best platform. Uh, we need to improve the, the setup because uh, most people, they come for the meeting not really prepared, but some do have their own meetings because they represent their own constituent. So by the time they come to the meetings, they have prepared some newspapers and here, here, here. Uh, Saturday, uh, these are things that we need to be done, uh, needs to be done in this, uh, in this uh, district or in this parliament in the constituency. The, the second one uh, is about uh, progressive political thoughts. Uh, again, thoughts sound so heavy, uh, but what it really means is conversations on a new level or a new discourse, a new level of discourse of politics. Say, for instance, for Malaysians in this hall, uh, we talk a lot about One Malaysia, but I believe One Malaysia is not just as long as I think it is even more important for us to talk about the good society, what, what is a good society for Malaysia, and, and, and uh, uh, what, are the, what are the trusts? Yes, we have the Rukun Negara, we have many principles as enshrined in the Constitution, but we need to review, we need to revisit, we need to to debate it, we need to come up with fresh ideas. And since the Prime Minister has already said that the gone are the days when the government is the no all and the be all, by all means, please come out and, and speak out and 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 and, um, and yeah and bring this conversation to a higher <coughs> level. Um, I give you one or two simple uh, examples why we need to bring the political discourse to a higher level. Some politicians don't even know that there is such thing as non-partisan politics or bipartisan politics. So the moment someone, and I'm not being personal here, but uh, yeah, uh, the moment someone speaks slightly different than the part official party line, yeah, then you are considered a traitor <laughs> or treason. Yeah. Uh, some people cannot differentiate between, okay, uh, I'm going to use very bland words here, my English is not very good, between bringing down the country and bringing down a government. So if you think, if you, if you want to bring down a government, you will be accused of being unpatriotic. Now, I, in, in my last article, I, I wrote something like this, I said, look, there is a difference between someone who wants to bring down the government and someone who wants to bring down the country. Bringing down the country is something else. You take up arms or you do something that is really violent and you really, uh, you know, you, you, yeah, you actually bring down the country in, 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 in real way, in the real meaning of it. Uh, so bringing down the country is unpatriotic, but bringing down the government is democratic. Of course, I have to add up by saying, I'm still a BN man and I want BN to win. <laughs> I'm simply clarifying that you don't just simply accuse people as unpatriotic simply because they say something else or they say, they, or they say something against you. Uh, our politics is too adversarial. Uh, it is, I mean, I don't mind if it is either me or you, but uh, it's like I, either you're with us or you're with them. That's not too bad. Because sometimes loyalty is also important. But doesn't mean that if you are with them, then therefore uh, you, are, you are bad. Yeah. And doesn't mean that whenever you are with us, then you are, you are good. I don't think politics is just black and white. Uh, there's more to politics. There's more to political stand than just uh, being with them or with us. But beyond that, which is even more important, I think we have to, I mean, especially for Malaysians, we really have to, to think through this um, and, and, and contribute uh, in whatever ways to, to, to bring uh, democracy, uh, uh, to make democracy in Malaysia work better, uh, 
to make it more mature and more progressive. Uh, my last project is called Siswa Madeka. Okay. Uh, translated into English will mean uh, uh, independent university student. Okay. Uh, it was organized in conjunction with the uh, Independent Day and Malaysia Day, Malaysia Day is two days ago, 16th of September. Uh, it is actually an online competition uh, for uh, Malaysian university students, both in Malaysia and also <coughs> abroad. Uh, in three categories, uh, slogan on Twitter, no, it has nothing to do with the official Malaysian uh, government's uh, slogan for the independent day, nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, second is uh, Instagram pictures, and third is vlog or short videos. Uh, why, we, why we choose online? Uh, because this is the medium that is closest to students. It is cheap, uh, easily accessible, you can also uh, engage overseas students and you do get some, some kind of uh, uh, contributions and participation. And for those of you who, Malaysian students who know Anwar Hadi, Anwar Hadi is one of the jury uh, for VLOG. I met him yesterday and I did my first VLOG with Anwar Hadi. <laughs> uh, but what is more important is uh, Independent Day celebration need not be limited to only the official ceremonies. The official ceremonies are important, they are symbolic, you have to do it. But young people may have their other ways of celebrating independence and Malaysia Day. They may have their own expression, they may have, they may have their own <coughs> aspiration, they may have their own interpretation about the meaning of independence and the meaning of patriotism. And when we look at the uh, entries into the competition, and that's exactly what we found out. The slogans, they are fresh. Uh, of course, it's sometimes quite lengthy. It's 20 words. Yeah. But they are fresh. Of course, we get a few which are totally out of this world. Of course, they don't win the prize, but it's OK. Yeah. We are right to speak up. Uh, the pictures that they send, uh, some are really good. Uh, the vlogs, at least one or two, uh, the one that got first prize and second prize, I think they can they can be sent to our uh, mainstream television and for consideration for next year's uh, Independent Day celebration. No, it's not. That's not the objective. The idea is, I think we need to celebrate uh, independent and whatever uh, in different ways uh, to enhance participation. And more importantly, to empower the young uh, to, to participate uh, in ways that they like uh, and, uh, and we don't have to spend a lot of money uh, on this. So now, how, what, what, what are all these? Uh, are they going to be relevant for the GE13? Yes and no. Depending on your worldview and depending on your understanding on of the issues that are being debated uh, prior to GE13. But I will simply summarize it by giving you this analogy. For the first 11 general election, <coughs> the issues debated, or non, not debated, but the issues that were important for the electorates were bread and butter issues, employment, education, welfare, uh, development. Uh, of course, uh, on issues on democracy, like human rights, and so on and so forth. But it is more of the bread and butter issue. GE13 is going to be the first general election where issues on democracy will take center stage to many of the electorates. And many here, if I were to use the University of Malaya uh, Center for Election and Democracy <coughs> Research, many here equals, uh, many here is like 30% of the electorates. And when I talk to other researchers from local universities, they were telling, though they have different numbers, but uh, the middle ground 
meaning to say people who are not going to, people who don't conventionally uh, vote for either the end of Akatan Raya, the middle ground, the, on the fence. I don't really like to use on the fence. I would rather use middle ground or middle Malaysia or people with their own uh, political, uh, independent uh, thinking. Yeah. Uh, atas Paga in Malay sounds like you are lalang. You don't have, uh, you don't insult people's intelligence just because they don't support this or that. Yeah. Uh, so middle ground is probably uh, a better way of saying it. This is probably the general election with the biggest number of the electorates belonging to the middle ground. 30% is probably the safest number that I can quote coming from the end. Um, so for either party, for them to win, they cannot win without the middle ground. And what are the issues debated among the electorates who belong to the middle ground? Among them are the four issues that I was trying to allude to. So, my beloved <coughs> brothers and sisters, thank you so much, and can we have the Q&A? Thank you. Thank you. Can I just stand here? And we, yeah. we just stand here yeah. and they will throw questions. Yeah. Colleagues, the floor is open. Questions, comments, and could I just ask <coughs> people to briefly uh, identify themselves? Yes, please. Assalamualaikum. Okay. Salam sejahtera. Salam sejahtera. Salam sejahtera. Salam sejahtera. Salam sejahtera. I'm Aslam Ali Jalil. I'm from Malaysia. Studying economics here. Um, I, uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate and thank you for being a progressive politician in Malaysia because I really respect your open-minded opinions in many issues. I have two very specific questions. The first one is uh, about the amendment of Universities and University Colleges Act. I just want to know how this actually impacts the election results in this coming general election because now students in universities can participate in politics. My second question is, I know you hold a very noble principle which is uh, the, super uh, the superiority of a general does not lie on how many enemies he slays. Oh, you're quoting from my website. But, yeah, <laughs> but, it, but it lies on how many enemies that become his companions. So with regards with the amendment of Section 114A Evidence Act about the censorship with the, for the internet users, I just would like to know what's your opinion about that. Does it with the amendment mean that the government is making a situation where the people become its enemies mm -hmm. and how about the rights of the internet users to express themselves? And as what you mentioned, nowadays uh, our Prime Minister Nathan <coughs> Raza wants to listen from the people. So I just would like to know your opinion. Thank you very much. Yeah, in universities, uh, when you sit for exam, you don't have to answer all questions. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I have good news for you. This is not an exam. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke too soon. Okay, um, the University and University College Act it was amended uh, quite recently. Uh, it now allows a student to be a member of uh, any political parties of his or her choice. But there is a but, which I'm not very happy about, but okay, like for the time being, uh, uh, political party activities are not allowed on campus. And the first uh, probably uh, casualty was the KPIC seminar, which was supposed to be organized in IIUM uh, on the 15th of September, but but somehow I think the university read uh, the, the amendment different way and, and because of that, the conference has to be organized outside. But it's not organized by students, it's organized by uh, a, a, a company, a business, a, 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 com a corporate entity. So uh, it's, not issue, it's not an issue for them to move the venue, but um, uh, it was debated uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, how, how would it influence the result for the, 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 the running of the general election campaign in particular. Well, <coughs> to, eat, to, to, to be a voter, to be an electorate, uh, you don't have to amend the, the act. Uh, uh, even before, before the amendment, students can, can vote, so it's not a problem. But now students can freely campaign because they are allowed to. Uh, so that is going to be quite impactful 
uh, when students for the first time uh, are legally uh, allowed to campaign in uh, <coughs> elections because this is a party activity outside campus. What is not allowed is inside campus. So it will be. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy about the amendment to that extent. Uh, if only the amendment went further, including some of the sections, but it's better than nothing. Yeah. Doing things from inside sometimes can be very difficult. <laughs> but, but okay. Uh, <coughs> section 114A. Basically, the government uh, amended uh, the Evidence Act to include a new Section 114A. Uh, 114A is actually about uh, going after cyber criminals and cyber terrorists and what have you which is needful, which is needed, and uh, myself and many others supported the idea that yes, we have to have a law, we have to have a mechanism, we have to have an instrument to go after all these culprits. But myself, Kairi Jamaluddin and Gan Ping Siu, uh, even though uh, this amendment was passed by parliament, uh, but uh, we, we were of the opinion that we, the government need to review it and amend it further to make it better simply because of the wording of S114A, which can actually make people who facilitate. Yeah. So because the section simply says people who are the editors or sub-editors, the publisher or co-publisher in whatever manner, including people who facilitate. Now that word facilitate uh, is open to abuse, can be misused. And uh, there's a lot of debate about it, uh, and 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 uh, the three of us remain steadfast that uh, we, we we should look at it. And and now I think the government has asked one of the minister, one of the senior minister, to talk to the stakeholders, uh, the bar council, and people in the IT business uh, to explain why S one one four A has to be done that way. But I think uh, the feeling on the ground is that we still have to amend it. But I did it. <coughs> Yes, please. And then, then I come to you. Yeah. One, two, any more in the queue at this stage? Oh, here, then here. Thank you very much, Mr. Saifuddin. Do you believe that your rapid ascent to the upper achievements of power with a reform minded agenda will pave the way for a new breed of progressive politicians with a new political culture, not just within the party, but within the broader political landscape? So to revisit um, Greg Lopez's comment, in a sense, do you think that perhaps you are not the last Mohican, you'll be a lonely Mohican for a while longer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be very quiet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. Um, if not, okay, I, I'm being very candid. Um, probably if not, I was sharing this, if you remember. Probably, if not because uh, we didn't do very well in 2008, I'm not here. Uh, I may be uh, an NMP, but not as a deputy minister. But because we didn't do very well, so there are and there are vacancies. So I become deputy minister. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if we win general election very very big, then uh, I'm afraid. It's not about me, it's about Prime Minister Najib's progressive ideas uh, may, may face some hiccups. Because there are many people in the party who thought that we are doing this as a reaction to the 2008 general election results. And we are doing this because we need to do it in order for us to win GE13. I'm doing it because I feel strongly about it regardless of GE 13, 14, and what have you. Uh, thank God I wrote about it after we win big uh, in 2004. Uh, so that's how I, I, I answer your question. Yeah, uh, yeah my name is Avidya, PhD student here. Um, your politics that you have explained is an ideal condition, but I don't think there is new thing uh, on Malaysian political system. I mean, it is still dominated by Parisa Nacional and also UMNO, and there is uh, little space for opposition to get um, power. And then 
there is still uh, an uh, ISA, Internal Security Act, and also the government is, you know, oppressing <coughs> demonstration openly, mm -hmm. like uh, we see in Percy uh, demonstration. So, do you think that the current system is ideal for Malaysians right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, very uh, <coughs> according to Freedom House, it is still uh, not fully free. Yeah. No, I, I will. I will. I will concur with you on the numbers and the things that we have not done uh, pretty well, uh, even under the leadership of Prime Minister Najib. But let me let me put it this way. Uh, first of all, I think Najib is quite sincere uh, in his uh, going forward. Uh, either by design or by default, I think he's still sincere. Yeah. By design, it's difficult to trace because uh, you don't see much of his. Uh, pronouncement before he became prime minister that seriously showed that he was uh, so that that genuinely or rather that that shows him uh, seriously uh, wanting to go the progressive way. But I can understand uh, why that happened. Uh, I think in Malaysian politics you don't speak too much until and unless you are in that kind of position. Saifu didn't spoke too much, and perhaps that's the reason why you asked me that question. <laughs> So I think he has been keeping it to himself, uh, very closely guarded, and only when he became prime minister, uh, he, 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 he talked about it and he tried to do some, to do as much as he could. But uh, we need to support the move. Uh, he has to be supported by a team that is equally uh, progressive, if not more progressive than him. And this is something that GE13 uh, is relevant. I mean, this is important. Uh, the kind of cabinet that he appointed uh, after uh, winning, see, I'm very confident, uh, <laughs> hopefully, uh, after winning GE13. Uh, we, are gonna, we have uh, announced that we will abolish ISA, we will replace it, hopefully, it's with a better uh, legislation. Uh, PA 2011, the Peace Assembly Act 2011, <coughs> is not an unknown language. Uh, Najib is talking non-traditional unknown language. The narrative is totally different. Yeah. Abolishing EO, the emergency ordinance, is not unknown uh, language. Uh, amending the university uh, is not uh, unknown language. Uh, Peace Assembly Act 2011 is not unknown language. This is new language for unknown. And many unknown members uh, still find it quite difficult to to understand it. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there are no discussions and, and I think I would I would I would rather pay more attention to well I hope that GE we do we do GE quickly and, and get over it and then start working on something else. Already there are now debate debates on certain issues, for instance, lowering the age of voting from twenty one to eighteen. Bringing back local council election. Uh, I know Penang State Government and the DAP and the Pakatan is trying to do it, but for whatever reason, that's another story, it's not happening. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, automatic registration of voters. So there are at least three, and there are others. Uh, reform of the upper house, the Senate. Uh, perhaps it would take many, many years and many, many GE before we can actually have the Senate members elected, but I suppose it's not rocket science and it's quite easy to reform the composition of the Senate members uh, and also uh, to actually uh, come up with some kind of better procedures of the appointment of Senate members so that they actually represent uh, the profile of the country rather than the profile of the party uh, that is in power. So those are four out of maybe many other issues that, that, that are now being debated. Not so much in the mainstream media, unfortunately, uh, but a lot in alternative media. And uh, I think the government have to come up with a roadmap. I have been telling my party members, or my leaders rather, that uh, a roadmap on these issues are required as part of our manifesto for GE13. Because mind you, among the people debating 
these issues are again people belonging to the middle ground and you can't win the general election without the support of the middle ground. Yeah. You make this the last question? Yep. Sure. Thanks. I enjoyed your, well, Ross Tapsel from the ANU. I, I enjoyed your comments about uh, by the lack of bipartisan politics and the lack of independent uh, debates in Malaysia. Maybe positive that perhaps one of the reasons is the lack of bipartisan media uh, and lack of independent journalism. So my question is, why don't we abolish the PPPA altogether <laughs> um, and see that flourish and hopefully debate? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm for the abolishing of the, the act, but uh, well, I don't think it will, it will go, <laughs> not, not in the near future. But I think uh, maybe this is interesting that you brought the issue on about the media. Um, I think uh, if you look at the uh, newspaper circulation, the trend now is that most mainstream media are on the way down. Mm -hmm. But Sina Haryan, The Sun, uh, and the Malay Mail uh, is on the way up in terms of circulation. Yeah. Uh, many young people don't watch uh, mainstream television, but they watch uh, internet TV, mob TV, uh, One Nation TV, or uh, Sinahayan Online, Sinahayan TV, and, and, and many others. Yeah. And for most people, I think their cup of coffee, uh, I mean their, their breakfast is uh, those newspapers plus uh, Malaysia TV, Malaysia <laughs> Insider, and, 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 uh, and a few others. So I think they have redefined the meaning, the notion of mainstream media. For some of us, mainstream media means uh, the mainstream media, including the TV and the radio, and what's online is alternative media, but for many people who are young, and most of the people that I know of who are in the middle ground, they are mainstream media is the other media. Uh, and the other media which used to be mainstream to them is out of steam <laughs> or out of stream <laughs> or whatever uh, or dinosaur or they don't I mean I know many people don't even yeah so